Shalom Aleichem. Let's begin the section. I'm glad that we are here together as always. That was a beautiful thing. So, we are commencing the journey of Abraham. So, who is Shalom, by the way? Who is Abraham? Abraham is the first of the Jewish people that's going to be not only a Jew in name, but a Jew in practice. Just to give a little quick insight before, Noah, from Parsha Noah, is the first one called in the Torah a tzaddik, ish tzaddik tamim. However, as our sages are quick to point out, there's one thing he lacked that Abraham possessed. So both might be equal within their own internal perfection, but Noah, as we see in Yiddish, tzaddik and pelts, was somebody who built a bonfire for himself and his family and invited his wife and his children and their, their family close, but he didn't extend the fire to the outside. He wasn't so proactive politically with bringing the masses in. Abraham will change this. Avraham Avinu begins the legacy of turning outward in such a way to make sure everybody gets a piece of the action. He is not somebody who is content with, if we are family, that we will enjoy the meal. He will go out and say, everybody must come in and everybody must be part of the experience. So, obviously, if Abraham is so critical and important, then all of the stories, all the narrative about everything he did is relevant. But here's the question. If you go through the text, and you learn about things like, he went to this location and that location, built an altar, brought a karban, went to Egypt, left Egypt, you're reading history. You're reading essentially the journey or the trek of an individual. It's very hard to personalize what that means unless the Torah is giving us other hints that we need to delve into. So that's what the story of Abraham is. It's really a journey about us. How do we know that? I'm not just inventing this off the top of my head. Part of the division of classical Kabbalah called the Zohar, the first comprehensive commentary on the whole Torah, is a section that's called Zohar Chadash. Right, the new Zohar, which is a part of its internal division. There it explains, whenever you hear in the Torah the name Avraham, or at this point in the journey of Ram, think right away, Neshama. Whenever you hear Sarah, or the name Sarai at this point, think body, goof. In other words, every line according to Kabbalah about Avraham and Sarah, Avraham and Sarai, is talking about the interrelationship between the soul and the body and everything therein. In fact, some of the famous commentators have written extensively on this subject. For example, if you go to the Vilna Gaon's Adera de Liangu and read Yona, the famous story of Yona and the whale, the big fish, every verse there he explains to be the secret of the relationship of the body and the soul. So the theme of body and soul is a very important theme in the Torah. Lech Lecha begins with the following words in English. Hashem said to Avram, by Yomer Hashem el Avram in Hebrew. So right away, if we're following the Zohar's formula, who's Hashem speaking to? The soul. To our soul. The Lubavitcher Rebbe in Lekut Sichot explains that everything in the Torah is a lesson for the current day, which means if we go from Avram, Avraham, the biblical figure, to Avram, Avraham, you, as a soul, then every line after that begins to make more sense. So here's the original translation according to the stone Chumash, which again is semi-accurate, but the Hebrew tells a different story. This is the English. Hashem says to Avram, go for yourself from your land, from your relatives, and from your father's house to a land I will show you. And the verse continues. And I'll make of you a great nation. I will bless you, make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. As Rashi explains, quoting the sages, meaning that nations will say to their sons and daughters, to their sons they'll say, may you be like Abraham. To their daughters they will say, may you be like Sarah. Okay, so let's just take the first part of this. God says to Abraham, go for yourself from your relatives and from your father's house to a land I will show you. So what if I told you that the entire mission of mankind, the whole mission of why the soul comes into a physical body to grapple with the challenges of the world, 
and everything therein, the whole mission, is wrapped up in the first couple of words. All of it. And there's more written on the first couple of words than probably any area of the Torah. There's books and books and books. We'll take a few ideas, make them tangible, and build upon them. I'll start with this. The first time God ever talks to Avram, Avraham, in a way of being proactive, that now you're a man for this mission, is the statement, Lech Lecha. Translation, go for yourself for your hana'a, for your benefit. However, because these are the opening words of God to the Jewish people, in this case the first Jewish neshama, there has to be something much deeper to this language. What does it mean, lech lecha? So let's start with this. Three different commentaries, all talking about the same words, but wrapped up together as one package. Lech lecha can mean go for you, or it can mean lech lecha. What else does Lamed mean? If not for, it means also to. Go to you. Go to yourself. Go to the truest you that you can be. That's level one. So God says to Avram, who's now coming out of ur Siddim, the famous land of idolatry and debauchery, etc., he's saying to him, the version of yourself that you think you are, eh, no. There's much better and bigger. Go to that. Lech lecha. Okay. The Baal Haturi, one of the famous commentators to the Torah, who is the son of the Rosh, the famous Tosaf of the Rosh in Talmud, who wrote a beautiful commentary using gematria and numerical values. He says, Lech Lecha has the value of 100. So Lamed is 30, Kaf is 20, 30 and 20 is 50, times 2, Lech Lecha is 100. Says the Balaturi, what does that refer to? Even though you think that you're barren, as he himself once said, famous of God, in Sechet Nida, where Avram says to Hashem, I've investigated the mazalot, the stars, and I can see via the position of my planet, it's not propitious, unpropitious. I'm not going to have children. And Hashem says to him very famously, remove yourself from the stars, you are bound to have them, and they'll be as numerous as the dust of the earth. Okay. Lech Lecha 100 is the age of Abraham. Right now, he's 75 years old. So what happens at 100 years of age? He's circumcised. That's, that's, at one year before, he's 99. He's mm -hmm. circumcised. What happens one year after his circumcision? So Brit Mila occurs at 99. At 100, what happens? Mm -hmm. Birth of Isaac. So says the Balaturi, Lech Lecha means go to your progeny that you think today you cannot have. I'll show you. Take this mission. I'm going to show you what this mission... Remember, the shant of the words is go for your benefit, right? What's the greatest benefit one can have? Having progeny. Well, Abraham right now is saying to himself, I've done the investigation in the natural order. In the natural order, I don't have the equipment, I don't have the ability to have a child. You're saying to me, go and build a nation through me? How? So, Lech Lecha says the Balaturi, equals 100 means, you will go to witness Yitzchak, the birth of your son. Okay? So now we have two pieces of information. One is Lech Lecha means go to you, go to the true version of you. And the second is the birth of Isaac, your son. But there's one more. In Kabbalah, we are taught the Sofei Tevot, the letters that have unique forms at the end, also possess unique numerical values. Kaf, as a Sofei letter, equals 500. So if we have Lech Lecha, 500 twice is 1,000, plus 60 is 1,060. That's exactly the value of the word Mishkan. Again, what letter ends the Mishkan? Nun, Nun, Nun. Sofit, right? Nun Sofit equals 700 as a unique value, as a Sofit letter. So when one factors in the word Mishkan, 1060 exactly, Nun Sofit is 700, plus 40, plus 20, plus 300, is the same as Lech Lecha. Hmm. Go to the Mishkan, meaning you, Avraham, 
You will become the one who will witness the building of the Mishkan and my tabernacle on earth. You're beginning that mission. You are starting, as the sages explain, 2,000 years of Torah. Kabara says in Sanhedrin, the world will be 6,000 years. 2,000 years of chaos, 2,000 years of Torah, 2,000 years of the era of Mashiach. Abraham's birth in the year 1948 after creation begins the actual period of 2,000 years of Torah. So now, we have the following three insights in the opening words of God to Abraham Avinu. We have Lech Lecha go to you. We have Lech Lecha hinting at the birth of Isaac, 100, and Lech Lecha hinting at the Mishkan, the building of the temple in the future. Now, whenever we have a series of hints in one word or pair of words, the novice thinks they're different things. Well, one talks about Isaac, one talks about the Mishkan, one talks about, but the sages say no. The Gemara says, These and these are the words of the living God. They're all connected. Which means, the simple reading of go to you, deeper reading, go to yourself, the deeper reading, go to Isaac, and the deeper reading, go to the Mishkan, are all connected. They all mean the same thing. So our question has to be, what does it mean that the birth of Isaac the same hint connects to the building of the Mishkan, connects to Abraham's own journey. How does that all relate? That's the question. So to answer the question, we have the rest of the verse, which we'll say right now is, from your land, from your relatives, from your father's house to a land I will show you. That's the commentary to explain why Isaac, the Mishkan, and his benefit are related. So now we have to understand what all that means. Start with the beginning. What does it mean building a Mishkan? What does it mean building a temple? Now we know, of course, if you take a trip to Israel and you do the you know, tour of Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the Temple Mount, where we have today only the Kotel, the Western Wall, is the site of the Besam Mikdash and the future Besam Mikdash as well. Okay, we know that. Historical fact about the land of Israel. But what does it mean to build a temple? Why are we building a temple? What is that? Okay. Can't one be close to Hashem simply by fine-tuning their own mind, their own perception, and have a relationship with God? Why do we have to have physical things that are put together, in this case rock and stone and precious metals, to build a temple? Why build a temple at all? Just have it as an interrelated connection, God and man. So, to understand that, we have to go to the verse that commands the temple being built. There's two temples. Not two temples like one and two, there's two kinds of temples. There's one called Mishkan, and there's one called Mikdash. What's the difference? The Mishkan, the one that equals Lech Lecha with the unique values, is a portable temple. You build it, you camp, deconstruct it, move. Build, deconstruct, move, in the case of our history, 42 times. Mikdash is what? Permanent. Permanent. It's stuck right there on the Temple Mount. Once that was built according to Jewish law, for example, you couldn't offer any sacrifice on your own with your own altar. You had to go to Yerushalayim, go up the Temple Mount, bring your bullock, bring your cow, bring your sheep to the side of the Temple. So the Temple in Yerushalayim is the fixed thing. The Mishkan of the desert is a transportable thing. But in either case, the Gemara in the Tractate of Eruvin explains, sometimes the Mikdash is a Mishkan, and sometimes the Mishkan is a Mikdash, with all the different meanings of that. In other way, we know that both temples, be it the Mishkan in the desert or the Mikdash, involve physical things. Stones, precious metals, gems, tapestries, Ram skins, tachash skins, etc. Physical things. So the infinite God wants physical things to build a temple. And the question is why? Let's start now with the verse. The original verse commanding the temple is in Parsha Truma, Vyasu li mikdash v'shachanti betocham. You will make for me a temple, mikdash, and I will dwell in them. That's the verse. So Rosh right away says, as the grammarian, it should say, 
Make for me a temple, shachanti b'tocho. I'll dwell in it, the temple. Why does it say in them? It doesn't make any sense grammatically. Build for me a temple and I will dwell in them. Well, you have the verb, the building, you have the object, the temple, and you have them dwelling in them. How does it all connect? So what's Rashi say very famously, quoting all the sages? You are the temple. In them. They are the temple. Not the physical building. Them. You're supposed to become a temple. Become a beacon of light and holiness and hope. All right, so if that's the case, it emboldens the question. Why a physical building at all? According to the verse, it says, I'm dwelling in you. I don't really care about the building. I care about you. If that's the case, why have a physical temple? So now we get into what's called the Ikar, the mission of why a soul comes into this world. The Arizal teaches in Eitz Chaim and Sifrei Kabbalah, he says, you do not come into the world in order to fix your own divine soul. Your nefesh elokit, your divine personality, perfect. A shining portion of God, to quote the book of Tanya in chapter 2, chelik eloka al mamash. You're an actual part of God from on high. Literally. And just as God is perfect, you're perfect too. Okay? So why come into the world? He says to fix the animal soul. Nefesh habrahamit. The animal of you. The divine soul, perfect. Hence, if you talk to anybody, even a criminal in prison, and you ask them, you know, did you ever have thoughts of God? Thoughts of a better you, thoughts of a better world? Yes, I do. I feel sometimes intensely spiritual. Well, then how did you murder 10 people? I mean, if you, if you feel God, how can it be that a part of you feels God and a part of you can do the unthinkable? Much of the Catholic mob, you know, much of going into the, you know, the mob in Italy and some of the old traditions involve people very religious, traditionally religious. Go to church every Sunday, light the candle, talk... Well, then how can you be a criminal these days and godly on this day? So the reason explains because everybody has a part of the divine and that part requires no work. It's automatic. The part you have to work with is the animal you, the animal psyche, that stands in contrast to your divine ambitions. The godly part knows its source, feels it. The animal part of you is the opposite. It goes downward says King Solomon in Kohelet, that nature is to run down into physicality. So the greatest gift you can do for God is not the offering of your divine soul. Easy. It's the offering of the animal soul. And how do we know that? Because the very first verse we have in the book describing sacrifice, Vayikra, says like this, Adam, ki yakriv mikem karban Hashem. When you will bring from them, from themselves, a sacrifice to God. Now, the sages all ask the question, should you say, Adam, ki akriv karban Hashem? What's the word mikem mean? It means that the animal that you bring, the physical bullet, the physical sheep, is only a symbol. What you want to bring is your animal, mikem from you. When the man brings from himself a sacrifice to God, that's when the mission happens. That's the mission being walked. In other words, the reason why physical things, you have to build a temple is because the objective is the lifting up of physicality, namely beginning with one's own physical consciousness, lifting it higher, and taking with it the whole of the surrounding physical world. That's the mission, in a nutshell. So that is why Torah, even though it's obsessively focused on self-perfection, on you doing it. Even the mitzvot, like we know, attracting bakot. How many mitzvot? 613. What's the actual division of the mitzvot? 248 do's, 365 do nots. The sages ask, to what does that correspond to? 248, the limbs of the human body, the bones of the body. 365, 365 gedim, channels of blood and energy running through the body. Well, that's body, that's you. That's you yourself. So the Torah's focus is very heavily about you becoming the temple. So why build a temple out of physical things?
because the physical things are the purpose of taking this, the ground here, and lifting it upward, lifting physicality higher. So when somebody asks the mission for the Jewish people, the response has to be their, their actual rectification slash elevation of all physical consciousness to its divine source, lifting it to the machsheba elyonah, the higher thought. So now, okay, let's talk about the human being for one second. If Avram, Avraham, is the secret of the soul, that's what we missed. So Avraham again is the secret of the soul in the whole narrative. Whenever you hear Abraham or Avram or Avraham, it means neshama. So if God says to Avraham, get up and go, lech lecha. Okay, we said three hints. Go for you, go to your son Isaac, go to the Mishkan. So now we have to ask the question, what is the connection between Mishkan and Isaac? If the Mishkan is the building of using physical materials for the purpose of creating physicality as a spiritual thing, lifting it higher, how does that in any way correspond to his son Isaac? If anything, when you have a son, the idea of having a child is a soul coming into the world. The building of the Mishkan is lifting the world back to God. How does that relate one to the other? What's that? Yes, it's connected to this. Very good. So let's start with the most basic thing. If you ask somebody to differentiate between two personality profiles, one being Abraham and one being his son Isaac, in respect to their divine mission, what is the differentiation between Abraham as a personality and Yitzchak? Great. So one is kindness, one is rigor, right? Chesed Gevura. Very good. Now, if we take it one step further, what does that mean? Now we know pshat is kindness versus rigor. So the most simple definition would be, if I'm going to approach you, and I'm an Abraham type, says the Midrash in this parsha, Abraham Avinu had an open tent, open on four different sides. He would walk out into the Midbar, into the desert, the wilderness, and say, all right, who's here? He finds somebody, brings them in, would put them under a certain kind of tree, which would then identify if the person had done idolatry or not, as taught at length. And then the education began. Are you hungry? Are you thirsty? Are you hot? Are you cold? He would then provide food, shelter, and clothing. Once you were the benefactor, or the one being benefited from his kindness, he would then say to you, who do you think just gave you the food, the shelter, the clothing? You think it's me? If you think it's me, then you have to pay me. And he would command an exorbitant fee. But if you say, says Abraham to his people, that God gave it to you, it's God providing it, that I will teach you how to pay God. And that's by a blessing, that's by a ritual. Does it require payment to me? Just payment to God. That's the Abraham approach. Everybody is worthy, everybody can come into the tent, the Ohel Avraham Avinu, and benefit. Now his son Yitzchak is different. Yitzchak will say to you, oh, you're in the tent now? Good. Let's talk about you. Why are you in this tent? What are you hoping to achieve? He would then take out the proverbial pick and start chipping away at this person, looking at the very deepest, subtle nuances of who they are, how they think, how they emote, how they behave, breaking everything down to details to make sure that every part of you is aligned with the spiritual mission. So he wasn't the general kind-hearted approach of his father. He was into the very deep investigation looking at all the parts of you critically, even if you would scientifically. Very different approaches. However, it doesn't answer the question. We just said a second ago that Lech Lecha means for you, it means Isaac's birth and it means the Mishkan. How does all this connect to the Mishkan? What does this mean? So we'll start with this. If you go back, rather forward in this case, to the binding of Isaac, the Akedah of Yitzchak, you learn about their movement toward the mountain called Moriah, Har Moriah. As we're moving toward the mountain, it mentions twice the statement, 
V'yelechu shneihem yachdav. The two traveled as one. V'yelechu shneihem yachdav. In the Zohar, in Parsha Vayera, where this famous moment takes place, the binding of Isaac, it says like this. What does it mean the two traveled as one? The Zohar says, fire like water, water like fire. So now going to what you said a moment ago about their qualities, it means that the kindness of Avraham has now become like the Gevura of Yitzchak. And the Gevura, the fire of Yitzchak, has become like the water, the kindness of Avraham. The two are now blended. The two are now one. So though they're different in how they approach the service, their differences now are grounded together as one. Okay. What does this mean? What does that allude to? So watch this. There's two dangers that an Abraham and Isaac soul present, one each. Abraham's nature is to be like water pouring into the world. When you say that he's kindness, or according to the Zohar and Parsha Vayera, like water, what is water's natural direction? Yeah. Downward. If it's rain, it's downward. Even if it's blowing from the wind, you know, launching it this way, it's still gonna end up downward. If the water were to accumulate up in the mountains, what happens after it finishes accumulating? It moves down, all the way down to the lowest empty basin. So water has an innate tendency to run above to below. That's Abraham. Abraham Avinu is as worldly as it gets, profoundly involved with the individual experience of each one. In fact, just parenthetically, who is the modern Hasidic master, modern in the biblical sense? Who is the modern master? who is said to personify the nature of Abraham. And he's the first. Hmm. I'll give you a hint. Every Sukkot we talk about, seven spiritual guests coming into the Sukkah, Baal Shem Tov. Okay? What was he like, the Baal Shem Tov? We know from the stories. He would travel in self-imposed exile to different towns. He would ask people, tell me about your wealth. Tell me about your health. How is your family? How is your business? It wasn't asking lofty questions. He was asking pragmatic questions. Pragmatica in Hebrew. And he would ask them, tell me about this and about that, very earthly, because he cared about worldly things. Now, if Abraham is the downward trajectory of water, meaning the soul running into the world, what can be the unfortunate result of running too deep into physical or worldly consciousness? What can happen to you? You run too far down in. Stuck in. Sure. You can end up becoming stuck. There are many, many lofty souls who, for lack of proper balance, become so part of the world they become engrossed in it to the point they can no longer serve in a spiritual capacity. They're overwhelmed by it. So the Gemara says in Pesachim, "Be careful of Abraham, from whom came forth which personality, which is called the waste of Abraham." Yishmael. Yishmael. Who is Yishmael? We know from the Gemara, in the second Shabbat, the famous Agatha. God said to the Yishmael nation, Do you want the Torah? To which they said, meaning the, the spiritual agent above, What is in this Torah? And the response was, Thou shalt not commit adultery. You cannot commit adultery. You have to be loyal to your wife, loyal to the one to whom you are bound to. You know what they said? Says the Gemara, they say, no thank you. It's not for us. Our nature, our temper is to have this levaciousness, this, this yearning, this passion. We need this. In other words, Abraham's waste product is running so deep into the world it becomes a waste where in which you no longer view the world as sacred. If you're committed to one, it implies, despite other temptations or yearnings, I'm devoted to the spiritual one. That's a spiritual principle, not a physical one. So Yishmael is the result of the Pesolet de Abraham, where it goes too deep into the world to become too much of the world. It loses the sense of here. It's all here. That's the problem. What about Isaac? Well, Isaac is fire. What is fire? What's the definition of fire? Water. Water. It goes up. It goes up. Mm -hmm.
know all the various parables for this brought many works of Hasidus of the Rebbe being one of them, many other works, was fire's nature, it goes upward. In fact, would it not be for the wick, would it be something flammable that you could attach it to, what would happen? Burns out, totally. The evidence is, have a person take a flamethrower, and not aimed at you, but just aimed in the air, shoot it out. The fire comes out, and is his stomach legumery. Goes up, disappears. If the fire is not connected to something physical, it runs up and out automatically. So the nature of fire explains Kabbalah and Chassidut is the run from below to above. This is like the soul with no body. The soul basically says, I have my divine affinity. This is my passion, my natural orientation. The idea of being put into a physical body with darkness, concealment, limitation, no. In fact, in the first chapter of Tanya, you learn, in the Sechet Nida, an oath is given to the soul. It has to actually take a shavua. Go down there and tahit tzaddik, be a tzaddik. Take the oath on that you will go down and surrender to the mission. Because the natural mission or state is, I want to be here. I have no yearning at all to be down there. So Isaac's fire means the natural passion of the soul to transcend the world altogether and not be part of the physical consciousness. Zero interest at all. So now, who is the waste product of Isaac? Who becomes the malign trait of him? That fire, that rum. Esau. 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 What did Esau do? What was his natural state? Esau was the one who, in the presence of his father Isaac, would act very appropriate and scholarly and curious, as the Gemara points out. The minute he was alone in the fields, he would go to unimaginable cruelty, rape and murder, etc. It's almost unthinkable. But what does that mean, ultimately? So, if a person is treating the world as if the world isn't important, it implies that I don't view the world as something meaningful. It's the waste product of a transcendent soul. I don't view the world as sacred or meaningful because the world is not really of any value. It's a physical, limiting thing. I can use it at will, and there's no consequences. <laughs> So both of these souls to their extreme produce a waste. So we can't have too much Abraham the water running into physical reality. We can't have too much Isaac the fire transcending physical reality. There has to be a midpoint, who we call Yaakov, Jacob. Hmm. Jacob is the metaphysical middle, Tiferet. Tiferet Yisrael, the perfect blend between the descent of his grandfather and the run of his father. Those two together become the quality of Yaakov. Now, okay, but where are we right now in the chronology? We're nowhere near the birth of Yaakov. We're just starting the Odyssey of Abraham. Now we just said, Lech Lecha means for your benefit, okay? It means Isaac's birth. Again, Lech Lecha is Gamachia 100. 100, the age of Abraham when Yitzchak was born. And Lech Lecha also equals, by a special calculation through the Sophie letters, Mishkan. Why would Isaac's birth be tied into the building of the Mishkan? So who, who is this being commanded to? This command of Lech Lecha. Who are we talking to? Abraham. Abraham. Okay. Now if Abraham, according to the Zohar Chadash, is each and every one of us, our souls. And our soul is going now into our physical experience. Remember, according to the Baal Shem Tov, these words mean the descent of the soul into the body, okay? I come down like, like Abraham, like the Baal Shem Tov. I enter into a physical body to carry out the mission. What is the mission? Build a Mishkan. Okay? How do I do that? By viewing physical things as needing to evolve. You cannot build a Mishkan by viewing the world as simply a detached entity that does not have spiritual value. You have to see the world as a potential a field potential, and lift it up to its divine source. You have to see it like that. Hence, as a simple example, if I'm thirsty, I pick up the cup of tea or the cup of water, I look at it, I observe it, okay, it's physical, it has physical properties, definable quantitative properties, I make a blessing, and I drink. 
By doing that, you took a physical thing with physical dimension and you gave it a spiritual value. By the blessing and the imbibing of the water, the tea, you lift it higher. It's now being utilized or incorporated for a higher spiritual mission. If I do Birkat HaMazon, I sit down at the table, Hamotzi, eat the meal, and I derive from the energy, the energy I need to carry out my service, and that's my intent, I lift the physicality of the actual eating experience higher. In other words, the only way we can fulfill the command of build for me a temple, and I will dwell in them, is not with the water of Abraham. That's a descent that goes into the physical world. That's cooperativeness to go into the world. You have to have the feeling of Isaac. You have to have that fire that says, everything that you see and do is meant for transcendent purposes. So Isaac's personality is the run up. Now, if he's alone, like we said, it produces a bad result, detachment. Like Isaac's son, Esau, having a detached personality, doesn't care for nor cater to the world. But if you can harness the Gevura of Yitzchak and take the fire that runs up and use that run for spiritual purposes, transforming physical to spiritual, now you can build the Mishkan. You cannot build the Mishkan with the love of Abraham alone. It requires the Gevura of Yitzchak. You have to have the fire. You have to have the heat and the energy. So again, the service of Abraham is running down. That's called the agreement of the soul to come into the physical world. The fire of Isaac in holiness is running up, taking an article of the physical world and lifting it to its divine source. So we have to have both. Hence, just by definition, you should know that we call the two arms of the body, according to the Zohar, Abraham and Isaac. Abraham is the right, the right arm, the right hand. Yitzchak, Jorah, Smola, the left arm. The Midler Rebbe writes in Biyori Zohar that when a person is davening, if you know when you pray, you tend to four times bow down and then stand up. He says, envision that when you bow down, there's some sacred article in the sand below you. And when he stands up, he lifts the article back to its source. Not with one hand, with two. The right hand goes down, that's Abraham's willingness to run down, the soul going down into a physical body, but you have to have the left hand to grab it, to lift it up. So Isaac's definition is running upward to my source. So again, without the two together in coordination, nothing happens. You have to have both. It's an essential thing. So now, we come to the next part of the question. Okay, we have lech lecha, God says to Avram, the Neshama, Lech Lecha, go for your benefit. What's my benefit? You're going to build a Mishkan. Okay, but I'm concerned. If I go down to the physical world to get involved with physicality, what will stop me from drowning in physical consciousness? Don't worry, because you're going with the birth of Isaac. Not the physical Isaac, the spiritual Isaac, the Gevura in oneself to run upward. You need to always have a sense of running up to take the mission from below to above. If we don't have Isaac, we don't have a mission. We'll drown in physicality with certainty. In fact, the Rebbe once explained that when you put water, water, of course, is the, the element, the concept of Abraham. If you mix it with dirt, what do you get? Mud. You get mud. And mud has a sinking effect. So just the water alone will cause you to sink. You have to have the heat, the fire of Isaac as well. So now we have this. Get up and go. And we have three things. From your land, okay? From your relatives, and from your father's house. And if you do all of that, to a land I will show you. Right now, so watch this. If you analyze the whole of the human being, how are we defined according to Torah? What are our parts? Well, we have physical. Right? We have the body, the limbs of the body, the physicality of the body. What else do we have besides physical? Spiritual. Okay. Spiritual, but let's, that's the other side of it. What is also body in orientation, but not davka physical? We have the physical body, then we have the soul, emotional, 
right? The emotional self, our character, our midot. What's next? Right? Yeah, intellect. And finally, after the intellect is the soul. So we have four worlds, according to our sages, that intersect in each and every human being. There is the physical aspect of who you are. There's the emotional part of who you are. There's the cognitive, intellectual part of who you are. And then there's the truth of who you are, the soul. All four come together in one being, hence our craziness. And by the way, if you notice that with people, when it comes to rectifying, fixing, repairing, it always falls into one of the four. Either it's a physical problem, or an emotional problem with character, or a cognitive problem, or a spiritual problem. If all four are together as one, you're complete. So, here's the mission. We just said before that the soul, the true you, no work at all. Right? The Arizal said, you go down into the world, you do not need to go down to fix your divine soul, it's fine. But your animal soul, yes. And what does the animal consist of? Three things. Do animals have a physicality? Of course. In fact, much of the Talmud talks about what happens if there's a blemish in the physicality. Trefa, Vela, etc. Laws of kosher. It's all physical. Do characters have, the animals have emotion? Yeah. Yeah, they have feelings, right? I just made a post a few hours ago about a dog that was left on the side of the road by its owner, mistakenly, and for four years straight, it returned back to the same corner every day to wait for the owner. So clearly, there's a heart, there's emotionality, right? Do animals have intelligence? Yes. In fact, as our sages say, that if you look at certain animals, each animal has a certain intelligence or aptitude that we can learn from. So, again, the three parts of an animal are physical body, emotional body, mind. We have that. What makes us unique is the fourth part, soul. A certain kind of soul. So now, when we talk about building the Mishkan for God and lifting physicality upward, and we combine that with the Arizal who says, you do not come into the world at all for the sake of rectifying your divine soul, we now have our answer. Divine soul, you're fine. You have to reach it though through fixing physical, emotional, cognitive, those three things. You have to lift them up. If you can fix your physical self. Now let's talk about it very, very simply. How, according to Judaism, to Jewish ritual practice, do you fix physical? What do we do that's physical, that directly pertains to the body, the limbs, all parts of us? Okay. Exercise. Okay. Mitzvot. Can you think of a mitzvah that we have that does not pertain to or borrow a physical article of this world? Name a mitzvah. Name one. Tzedakah. Yeah. Right, the most comprehensive of all. How does one give tzedakah? What do you need? Money. Well, how do you make money? Work. Either paper, right? Yeah. Printing dollar bills or Coin. metal from the earth. Okay? How about tefillin? Where does tefillin come from? An animal. Leather. Right, the leather part of an animal. The actual cloth on the inside plant. Every mitzvah that we use involves not only physical things, but some part of the physical body. As an example, if I take a coin out of my pocket to give this metal thing from the earth to a pushka, to a tzedakah box, how do I do it? I take two fingers and I close it around the coin. I take the hand, which is a part of the two fingers. I extend the arm over to the recipient, either a box or someone's hand, and I drop it in their hand. I just utilized all the parts of, the, of my hand. Yes? Well, I thought of the two wrists right away that don't have the physicality. Okay, go ahead. Kriyashma. Well, you have to say it, but it's not physical. Okay. Physical. Except what do you have to do to say it? Let me ask you, can you, th can you think it and fulfill the requirement to say Shema twice a day? Except, and your voice, and your breath, and your lungs. So in other words, even things are more... What about, what about keep it up and... Okay, excellent. So how does one do keep it up and... 
which means honor your father and mother. What's that look like? Uh, so there's, there's a lot, there's a lot of it. I'll, I mean, like the parents and niece are running the job and a lot of honor. Beautiful, so something physical. But if they're not, there's other things that maybe aren't physical because respect is also like a non-tangible thing. Except respect has to come into tangible forms. So for example, if I say I respect you, right? The only way at a human level I can show you respect is by involving myself in things you care about. So for you care, for example, about, let's take the cup of water. Let's say the parent happens to love a cup of tea. Okay, so every time the parent comes near my room, want some tea, get the tea, bring it over. So physical rituals connected to a metaphysical concept. So even learning Torah requires you open up a book or you have to hear lectures being given from a book to internalize it. So everything is using, either from physical, or using physical, or becoming physical. In the case of Kibbut Avon Aim, everything about respect involves acts that you do that are tangible from the physical world that shows respect. You can never show respect to someone else by saying, I respect you, and they ask you, how do you respect me? What does that mean? If it doesn't come into a tangible physical form of some type, it's only an emotion, which itself is physical, <laughs> but it's not materialized. So even, and I get where you're coming from, even metaphysical principles that are more meditative by nature have to still involve using physical things to accomplish them, right? right. So tzedakah, it's like even uh, sukkah, right? Building a sukkah, same thing. You have to have the wood or the metal, the palm fronds, the hoshana, the four species of plants. In other words, everything you do that involves a physical part of your body is because part of the physical transformation of you is connecting physicality to spiritual things. Hence, we do not have a tradition that tells us to sit and think about all of the Kabbalistic meanings of something, but not bind it. In fact, the Rebbe says the opposite. If you sat down, hypothetically, and before you had the cup of water, you sat down and said, I'm gonna meditate on all the different Yehudim, all the different metaphysical meanings of the water through the Arizal and the Ramak, etc. But I'm never going to drink the water. So we ask the question, what happens? Nothing. Because what happened was, you created through the contemplation process a tremendous surge of awareness. But then, like electricity, you never gave it a bulb to shine into. If you have chashmal electricity, but there's no filament, there's no bulb, do you have light? No. no. So if a person is to sit and think about these things, but not physically do them, they're like lights and potential, but they never shine into our world. So hence, you have to use physicality to create the connection between the idea and the act, to make it shine outward into the physical world. So, Level one is mitzvot that rectify the body. That also includes things like healthy practices. The Rambam and Hilchot Deo talking about proper healthy practices, etc. These are all ideas that pertain to the physical body. Training the physical body to be holy. Okay, what's next? After the physical. Emotions. Emotional. Do we have mitzvot that pertain to the emotional? Oh, we have it every year, 49 days. <laughs> What's between Passover and Shavuot? Counting the Omer, taking the seven times seven traits of the heart and going into them with a detective's eye, looking at all the possible combinations, permutations to make sure your character is right. How many books of Musar have been written about the rectification of the heart? Too many, <laughs> if there is such a thing. Many, many books. Chobot HaLevavot, Tomer Devorah of the Ramak, and many, many more. Musar is a critical examination of one's character at the emotional level, rectifying the heart. Okay, so we have that whole discipline of study. Cognitive, what rectifies the mind? Torah. Torah, yeah. I mean, the most basic exercise is to learn how to think like God. How does God think? It's in the Torah, in all the works of the Torah the Torah, the commentators, you're learning how to think like God. So when the mind changes perception 
from a world of pure physicality and darkness to a world of great potential where God's light can impregnate it, where God's light can dwell in it. A change of perception is how we change and fix the mind. Even basic things. The third Rebbe of Lubavitch, uh, Tzemak Tzedek, campaigning with the famous slogan, think good, it'll be good. Why did he say that? Because as you read deeper in the Zohar, God's thoughts are only pure. There is no impure thought. Meaning, if you want to be like God, you have to think like God. You have to be optimistic. You have to look for light, not darkness. Look for good, not evil. Etc. and so on. So therefore, if you learn Torah to train the mind, if you practice Musar, hopefully good Musar, healthy, Kabbalistic Musar, to train the heart, if you practice the ritual act of mitzvot to train the body, now what you've done is you've gone from the outside all the way to the inside. And once you've purified body, heart, and mind, guess what shines naturally and easily? Soul. That's the revelation of your soul to yourself. So, if you go back to the verse, one more time, Hashem speaks to Avram. Go to yourself, from your land, from your relatives, from your father's house to a land I will show you. Now the whole thing makes sense. Go to you, we said that the basic meaning is for your benefit, right? But the deeper reading of many commentators is, go to you. Who is the true you that we're talking about? In the Shaman. Now you might ask the question, but wait, a, how do I do that? How do I go from the person I am to the person I really want to be, the deepest part of my reality, my true existence. No problem. I'm going to show you how to build a mishkan. Number one, you have to use physical materials. Number two, you have to have the run and the fire of an Isaac. You can't be content in the status quo of physical reality. You have to go up, lifting it up with two hands, not one. So how do we do it? Start with your land, the artsakha. What does your land correspond to? Yeah, and that is your? Physical. Physical. Mm. Body. The land is the physicality of the ground. I mean, dafka literally, correct? So, the land itself from which what comes? What comes out of the ground, out of the dirt, out of the physicality? Your body. As we know, I'll keep shot. Why is man called Adam? What's the root of Adam? Adama, physical. But it can also be Edame le Elyon, resembling God, resembling the transcendent, if he works properly. So, the first level is Avram, talking to you, the soul. Lech lecha, go to your soul by building in Mishkan through the fire of Isaac that runs upward. And how do I get there? What's the road for that? No problem. Start Me'artzecha. From your land. Keep the mitzvot. Use your body for holy purposes. Use your fingers to give tzedakah. Use your arm to wrap tefillin. Use your hand and your eyes to light Shabbat candles. By the way, when a woman lights Shabbat candles, the main mitzvah is to look at the candles. You make a bracha, yes, but you cover the eyes. You meant to look and see in the flame three distinct kinds of color. It's using the eyes. The eyes, the imagination, the connection. So here we have, use your physical body and all of its limbs and expressions for holy purposes. Okay, what's next? Umim oladcha, from your relatives. Who are there? Now what's a relative? It doesn't say mother or father yet. What are relatives? Blood relationships. Relationships, right? So who, as an example, is a relative of a person outside of mother and father? Cousins, nephews, right? More distant family. So what does the relatives correspond to? Explain the sages. To emotions of the heart, the midot. Why are they called relatives? Because mother and father is actually your mind, as we'll explain the relatives, the extension of mind, is heart. Which is even evident from how we feel, right? 
How often do people feel something because the mind says to them one thing, when in truth it's another? They thought they saw something, they judge it a certain way, and hence, boom, an emotion comes supporting the initial perception. If they had a negative decision in their mind, the heart says, ooh, I don't like it. If they thought this was something positive and good, the heart says, I love it. The heart follows what's called the avar de sechel, follows the mind. So your relatives, not directly the parents, but the seconds, the close seconds and thirds, is called the heart. Now, we say traditionally that there are six properties of the heart. Love, fear, mercy, trust, sincerity, and connection. If you look at the word, umim oladcha, it can be broken into two parts. Vav, mim oladcha. The six traits are your relatives. So now we have two. We have Avram, you the Nisham, go to you, build a Mishkan out of the physical world around you through the quality of eyes of your son, have that lift off. And if you wonder, how do I get there? Start with your land, your physicality. Then after you discipline your body through the mitzvot and the practice of Torah, go further to your heart, your relatives. Start working on the condition of your emotions. Learn how to respond in a healthy, spiritual way. Learn how to rectify the heart. And then if you say, okay, I did it. I keep the mitzvot. I train my heart every year. I'm bettering my character, my emotions. What's next? How do I get there? Third one is, mibet avicha from your father's house. Explain the sages. Father, who is the father's house? It doesn't mean the shot of what it sounds like. The father's house would mean the house, right? The home. This means deeper the womb of the mother. Father's house. Why? Because where is the baby conceived? The womb. Now, its first nine months in this world, in gestation and physical development, is in what's called Beit Rechem, the house of the womb. Without the mother principle, the father's potential can never be actualized. Father's house means in that place where you are conceived, which is the combination of the father and the mother principles, together as one, which you're a byproduct of. In other words, your father's house, in terms of you, the initial root of everything, mind. By the way, even according to Kabbalah, when we talk about wisdom and understanding, Chachma and Bina, they're called in the language of the Zohar, Abba ve Ima. Abba is called wisdom, Ima is called Bina, deep comprehension. So when the Zohar comes and says, in the fifth commandment of the Ten Commandments, honor your father and mother. The Zohar comes and says, your father, the written Torah, which is wisdom, and your mother, the oral Torah, which is Bina. So Chachma and Bina are called, as part Sufim, Abba Ve'ima. Which means now, the highest level is, in terms of development, retrain your mind to think like God. Now in the beginning, you might argue, let's start with the brain, and then go to the heart and go to the body. Well, that's ideal. But we've learned through history, what sticks more with people? Starting with the body or starting with the head? It's actually starting with the body. Did you know that apprenticeship is a very valuable thing because when you apprentice, you don't yet understand the full value, even the full width of what you're doing. As an example, the Keck School of Medicine at USC recently, in the last couple of years, began a program that says, when the medical student goes in for the first year, we're not gonna wait any longer until year three to expose you to patients. In year one, you're gonna be in the hospital already following the doctors to learn about people, how they talk, how they work, how they look. We're not gonna confine you to a textbook. You're gonna be apprenticing day one. You can't talk to the patients yet, and you certainly can't diagnose or treat them, but you can watch, and you can physically follow and observe the process. The physical body has an edge. If you start with the physical, you can train the heart and train the mind how to be. Just by the students, they reported an incredible statistics. Just by the students observing their senior doctors treating their patients, they have become, this is a statistical fact, 
more compassionate, which is a heart thing, and much sharper cognitively when it comes in the future to diagnosis. Because they've observed their own senior practitioners doing it. They watch how it's done, they're learning. So we start with the body, we move to the heart, we move to the mind. In the Torah world, physical mitzvot, musar, fixing the heart, Talmud Torah, learning Torah, and all of its different levels. And if you do that, it concludes, El Ha'aretz, Asher Areka, to a land I will show you. What's that level called? The soul. The neshama itself. That's the highest of the four levels. In Kabbalah we say that the four worlds that correspond to, in the greater sense, physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, have these names. The world of Asiya. The world of Asiya making is physicality. The world of Yetzira is Mido, the heart. The world of Bria, mind. The world of Atsilut, meaning nearness to God, the soul. They all come from one verse in the Torah. Kol hanikra bishmi uchvodi. Rativ, Yitzartiv, Af Asitiv. All I have made in my honor, in my name, the world of Atsilut. Barativ, I have formed something from nothing, mind. Yitzartiv, I have created something from something, the heart. Af Asitiv, I have made Asiya, physical. Four worlds, all exist within. The world of Atsilut, the world of perfection. You don't have to touch it, you don't have to change it, you don't have to alter it. It is a world of perfection. In the words of the Zohar, the Tikkuni Zohar, at that level, he and his light, he and his actions are one. So, perfect. What about Bria, mind, Yetzira, heart, Asiya, body? That is where the fixing has to occur. By the way, it's also why, according to the Torah, how many days and nights was Moshe Rabbeinu on Har Sinai? Forty. Why forty? Says the Urachaim in Parsha Yitro, because forty is ten times four. Ten days, ten nights for the body, Asiya. Ten days, ten nights for the heart, Yetzira. Ten days, ten nights for the mind, Bria. Ten days, ten nights to reveal the, the Neshama, the world of Atsilut. So, that is the mission. So one more time to wrap the whole thing up nicely. We come into a world, the philosophical question has always been asked is, why take that journey to begin with, if the whole purpose of coming down is to go back to God, if we're already with God from the beginning, why take the journey at all? And the answer is because you're only close to God relatively because the neshama by its definition is a godly thing. Your objective, make the animal a godly thing. Now we said, what does the animal consist of? Three things, limbs of a body, emotion, and intellect, right? So in us, Limbs of the body, asiya, physical. Heart, yetzira, emotional. Mind, bria, intellect. We come down to this world, and Hashem says, lech lecha, do it for your benefit. I'm gonna show your soul to you in such a way that you've never seen. How will you do that? You're gonna build a mishkan. You're gonna build a temple out of physical things. And how do I do that? I might get lost in physicality. No, you won't, because guess what? Isaac will be born. I will give you a metaphysical fire to take you from below to above. You're not going to be content here. You're going to want up there. But you'll do it through the water of you, through involvement with here. Okay, well, how do I do it then? I agree. Fine. Start. Me'artzecha. From your land. Take your physical body. Train it to be divine. And how? Through mitzvot. Again, 248 dues. All bones and limbs of the body will get connected. 365 don'ts to avoid adding additional concealment to the world. Fine. What's next? Yetzira. From your birthplace, from your relatives is the translation. Now from the heart. Once you train the body how to be, you can directly impact the quality of your emotional self. You will learn to love in a healthy way. You will learn to fear only God nothing of this world. You will have compassion. You will learn all the different traits because if you start with the body, it leads to the heart. 
Okay, I'm working my heart. Now what do I do? Fine. May Beit Avicha, from your father's house, take mind, father and mother, train them to be a good father and mother. How? By learning the Torah. If the mind itself changes perception, it changes how the emotions come out. If the emotions come out healthier, it changes how the body moves. That's all linked. And if you do that, El Ha'aretz Asher Areka to a land I will show you to yourself. I'm going to show you now in the Shama after you fixed all dimensions of the animal, the limbs of the body, the middle of the heart, the mind itself. That's the mission. And it goes on even from that further. So the way we say it in the words of the Arizal is, get up and go from your land, the world of Asiya. Lift Asiya upward. From your birthplace, the world of Yetzirah. From your father's house, the world of Bria, to a land I will show you, the world of Atsilut. Which means practically for us, we each have to build the Mishkan. How do we do it? Out of physical materials. What physical materials are those? Every part of our physical being. Limbs of the body, heart, mind. If those three come together, we can each reach a level called to a land I will show you. And last thing just to understand is that when we talk about the purpose of connecting with God, in Hasidus, they often describe it as coupling, like a sexual metaphor, because the deepest thing one can understand in this world is closeness to somebody else, in the ultimate bonding sense, is that kind of relationship, which means the ultimate objective is a divine intimacy, where all of you is part of all of it. All of him, God. Often the soul is called a bride, God's called the groom. So the ultimate goal is a complete unification of both. And just like in human affairs, the person's physically with you, but emotionally distant. Can that be felt? Of course. Mm -hmm. It's very tangible. If somebody is emoting, but is mentally distracted, can that be felt? Yes. When a person is truly there with you, in body, heart, and mind, there's a quality to that which brings out the soul. So this, these words here, to a land I will show you, El Ha'aretz Asher Areka, those words equal 1,050, which the Rebbe of Kamarna explains is the value of the word Tashmish, which means bonding. The metaphor of the word again for sexual bonding. But here it means the bonding between God and the person. Not just superficial bonding, a bonding more analogous to sexual union, meaning a true bond, a complete bond, involving the limbs of the body, the emotions of the heart, the clarity of the mind, and the oneness of the soul, all bound together in complete unity. Akuda echat, it's called. So, this is now how we understand the journey of Lech Lecha. The mission of every one of us, each one of us here and beyond is, we have to always remember, we're not here to fix that perfect part of ourselves. It's easy. We're here now to fix the part of ourselves that's longing to be connected, but unfortunately because of our condition, is often involved in other things. To fix the animal, to bring the animal to God means, you have to have a physicality, you have to have a heart and a mind. By using the Torah in the mitzvot, to train the body through mitzvot, physical command and ritual, to train the heart through musar and character refinement, to train the mind through the switching of perception by the learning of Torah, brings you to a level of showing you to yourself. You will find your neshama through that, but not just the neshama that you once had before you came in. The true neshama. Because remember something, before you came into the world, all it was was a neshama. The animal soul wasn't involved yet. But by doing this, you bring an additional thing to this. Not only the soul that you naturally have, but even the part of you whose initial orientation or wiring is to the opposite. You convert that into a partner for God. And when that happens, the light that comes out of that is so tremendous that explains Kabbalah and Hasidus, it even adds light to the world of Atsilut which is a whole other discussion at some other time. But for right now, understand this is our journey. You have to build the Mishkan out of physical things. 
you must have the fire of Isaac to do it. Begin with your body every day, go to your heart, move to your mind, and eventually, every day, progressively, it reveals the soul. By doing this, we are truly emulating Avraham Avinu, and Yitzchak Avinu, and Yaakov Avinu, from individual to individual, to the tribes, all the way down to the current generation. So we should be able to move forward from day to day, advancing higher, repeating the mission every day, in order to bring us to a true level of Tashmish, or El Ha'aretz Asher Areka, to a land that will show you. Any questions? Yes. Yes. And still live? Yes. In fact, that's a great question because what happens if you end up doing all of this and you succeed, right? So the, yeah. answer, the answer is certain exceptional souls in human history have achieved this in an absolute fashion. Uh, Metushalach, even according to many sources, the daughter of Pharaoh, Batya, oh, okay. all of her sacrifice. Rabbi Yehoshua ben Levi and many others, Eliyahu Hanavi. But in our mission, Think of it as day by day, week by week, you're elevating different parts of it. So even if one day you happen to be successful, you can bring your body, your heart, and your mind to the fold. Yeah. Nonetheless, it won't be in an absolute way. It'll be pieces, parts of the puzzle that you elevate. As time goes on, more of you comes. The Zohar in Parshat Mishpatim, <clears throat> name a section called Saba Mishpatim, which deals with all the mysteries of reincarnation and other such things. There it says like this, in the beginning, even though we do this every day, the main focus is your nefesh, your body. So think about day one stepping into a shul or stepping into Judaism. What are you practicing day one? Mitzvot, right? What do I do? How do I do it? What's the halacha? What's the, the path? It's very physical. It says, if you merit, and you rectify the body, the nefesh level, you are given a ruach. It means now, the main focus is going to be rectification of the heart, master of the emotions. Sheish ketzavot halev, the six extremities of the heart. Now, we do it every day anyways, but not as a singular focus. Here, that becomes the main emphasis of the avodah. If you merit that, it says, you're given a neshama. Now, the main focus will be mind. If you achieve that, you're given Chaya, not only the Yechida. And who has the Chaya and the Yechida? This is so rare that to quote the Rashbi, he says, I have seen the Bnei Aliyah, the highest souls of the generation, and they are few. So that level is an extraordinary achievement that only very few ever have. Would that be like the the Rebbe's, the Tzaddikim, the people of a generation who clearly stand out as having a different path than we have. But at the same time, we should remind people, people often misinterpret what it means to have lower level struggle. The Rebbe is very clear about this. He would often tell people, I'm jealous of you for having that struggle. Because again, though I already exist with a certain kind of wiring, however, you get the chance to convert darkness into light to bring a rebellious animal to the altar, to learn how to train the limbs, the heart, and the mind to be godly, and the light that can produce will far outshine my light. The way the Rebbe said it once, quoting the Gemara was, what good is a candle at noon? Describing that we do a Bikur Chametz with a candle, that a candle at nighttime stands out beautifully. But that same candle at noon, with the sun behind you, isn't so remarkable. So the Gemara is basically saying on a deeper level that what good is a soul unto itself with the sun, God shining behind it? Again, Shemesh Yomagin Havayalukim. When it comes into a body, into darkness, that's when the candle shines out. That's when it really stands out as something remarkable. So therefore, even though we're not the Ne Aliyah, to quote the Talmud, but we are individuals capable of taking an animal and training that animal to be godly by training the body, the heart, and the mind. And we can reveal the soul as a process. But we can 
can never ever, God forbid, ever misinterpret that our struggles are in any way diminishing us. So this is kind of like, it's kind of like similar question but a different angle. So like, okay, like Tim and Jake and other people, I mean, I've already said that we're born here for everyone who has a specific mission. Yes. Your soul has a specific mission. But then, and then once it completes the mission, it's going to go back to Shemite. Right. So basically you're saying that it doesn't matter how advanced your Nisham is coming, it still has a separate mission from Developing. Not to mention, every time you complete a mission can mean over multiple lifetimes in terms of the fullest potential of a given soul. So as Rabbi Chaim Vital says, quoting the Arizal from Shari Kedusha, he says, every individual has to go through in some lifetimes being a Kohen, other times a Levi, other times Yisrael. And this might take multiple, multiple hundreds of lifetimes and thousands because if every mitzvah in the Torah is required for your completion, but many of the mitzvot are only endemic to certain parts of the Jewish population. The Kohanim have the bulk of it in the Besamikdash. Who here is a Kohen? I'm not. I'm a Levi. So as a Levi alone, I can't fulfill the Kohen's practices unless I've had a chance to be a Kohen. And likewise a Levi, an Israelite, etc. So ultimately, all of that together, together with the main mission, together with all the different parts of it, yields a completion of sorts. It's life after life, part after part, generation after generation. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it makes sense, but I, I guess my question is more like, can you give an example to me? Yes. Can we have it only for some respect for other people? Can you come up here and finish the recording? If you don't mind. Any after, after the recording? No, 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 oh, no, no, yeah. I have, no, have to, no, 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 I have to shut the place down. Oh, don't worry. Okay. No, 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 no more question over here? Oh, in the word of the next one, you said he's kind of. Yes. Did Abraham get the Nebuah or Isaac when he was 100 years old? Meaning, did he have the Nebuah to know this? No. No. Not yet. What he was being told was that hidden in those words is the promise that that's coming. But he didn't get it. No. All he was told, in fact, the fact he didn't tell him, as Rashi brings out in the commentary, is the reward. Because every step you take toward your mission, if you don't know what the reward's going to be, is even greater reward. So every time he went to the unknown, the unfamiliar, rebelling against his previous self, this is a tremendous suffering. So all the good that came from him is because he went into an unknown world, again, 2,000 years of Torah, being the first, the first one to walk that path. But buried in the text is all the different steps that we take as well to reach that same kind of experience. Great question. Okay, thank you. And after class, we can continue our dialogue. And also, if you have any other questions, then please ask. Okay, thank you. <laughs>